Scripture reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 11 through 18. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 11 through 18. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence, so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath is, an oath is given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we, who have taken refuge, would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. Well, good morning. It is truly excellent to be with each and every one of you this morning, so thankful to be able to assemble with our family here at West Mason. For those watching online, thankful that you're able to tune in, to worship our great God, and to give him praise. If you could join me in a word of prayer to begin, I just want to say a prayer for uh, those who are grieving the loss of our brother Tom Spar. So if you would join me. Our Heavenly Father, we approach your throne once again. We bow our heads again, Father, because you are our king. We fold our hands again, Father, because we have so much that we need to ask you for and that we trust you for. And we incline our hearts to you once more, Father, because you are the one that fills them up. We know, Father, there are so many hearts heavy and broken and hurting right now because in this life we have had to say goodbye to our brother Tom Spar. We ask, Lord, that you would comfort all of us with the assurance of the hope that he is with you. I ask, Father, that you would especially be with his family, that even through the grieving and the feeling of loss and the hurt, that hearts would be turned to you and that you would be glorified in all things. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. This morning I want to talk about standing on the promises, as we just sang. I was asked a while ago, it seems, to do a sermon on the promises of God. And it's taken me a little while, but I've gotten here before the end of the year. And then I started doing some research and found that other people have had this idea well before me, as is usually the case. One researcher counted 7,000 promises in our 66 books in the Bible. 7,000, well over 7,000 promises of God. So let's start with the first one. <laughs> Look, we could stay here the rest of this week. And I wouldn't have time to go through this. This is a lifelong endeavor to go and to dig in and to see all the many things. But this is what I want to impress upon you this morning. That's impressed upon me as I've studied this. God is God. He owes us nothing. He does not have to make promises. And yet, time and time again, on every page of Scripture, it seems that he is doing just that. Giving us his word, his oath a confirmation that things will turn out in a certain way. What kind of God does that? Ultimate power, full control, the creator of all things, and he's making promises to you and to me as his creation. Good question is, following that, what are we doing with those promises? When we go through scripture, and whether it's promises to specific people, like to Abraham, as we just read about in Hebrews 6, or whether it's to broader application, open to all people to take advantage of a promise. The fact that God makes promises in the first place should tell us something about his character, his nature, and his desire for us to trust him. That's what I want us to focus on this morning, and I want to use verse 18 of Hebrews 6 that Scott just read for us. If you're still there in your Bibles, I'd encourage you to underline it or make special note of it in your notes because this is where our lesson comes from this morning. We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. 
This is after the Hebrews writer has pointed to Abraham as an example that we can, like him, put our hope in God, that there is this assurance because God said it. And it's not just that he promised it, but he gave an oath. Surely I will fulfill my promises to you. And so I want to break this verse down this morning and see how we can be standing on the promises that God gives to us that we can take a hold of this morning. First, I think it's fascinating that it describes the people of God as those who have fled for refuge or have taken refuge in this God who makes promises. You see, I think it doesn't take too long living in this world to realize that it's easy to be cynical. The world breeds cynicism, being untrusting, uncertain, not knowing if you're standing on solid ground or not. And yet, the God who made us calls us to flee to him, to have an open, honest, and authentic life because unlike everyone else and unlike any other thing you've experienced, God doesn't break promises. Now, I want you to think about this because this is untrue for every other promise giver that you will encounter in your life. As well-intentioned as any person might be or any organization might give you a guarantee of something, in this life there are going to be times where even the most well-intentioned people cannot follow through on the things that they say they will do for you or just in general. And so we learn as we grow and as we experience this to take promises with a grain of salt, to have a backup plan in the very possible event that they might fail. We've got to set this way of thinking aside when it comes to promises that come from our Lord. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 21 in your Old Testament. Here's an example of a promise specific to a group of people, the Israelites, as they're being led into the promised land. God promised them to give them this land. And there was a group that came in 40 years before, got right up to the border, and God said, I've given it to you already. And they said, there's no way. God said, if you don't want my promise, you can wander around in the desert until your children are raised up. And a new generation will have the opportunity to lay hold of this promise. But I want you to notice what happens once Joshua leads them in, once the conquests have occurred, and once they begin settling in the land, this is what the Bible says about God and his working through this settlement of the promised land. Joshua 21, verses 43 to 45, read this way. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it, and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Forty-five's the key here. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. That is truly supernatural. As we've said, people make promises, and if we're well-intentioned and try our hardest, most of the time we follow through on those. But we're human, and we're not in full control. When we come to a God that is God and in full control, when he says something, you can go to the bank on it. We can be sure of it. Because he is an unchanging God whose promises cannot fail because it's his mouth that's speaking them. It's his word that upholds them. This leads Peter to describe in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, a, verse, a passage that we've been studying a lot on Wednesday nights and earlier in Sunday mornings this quarter. The idea that we can truly flee to him, that we can find something that nothing else in the world offers. True trust that is unfailing. Peter describes it this way. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. You're tired of the world and the way the world acts? You have escape because God has extended his hand to you in the person of Jesus Christ. 
promises that cannot fail, a proven track record through all of Scripture and even in our lives that the promises of God do not falter on his end. It's powerful that Peter says here, we have been offered escape because God has made promises to us that we can leave our sinful desires behind and the corruption we see in the world. We don't have to live like that anymore. We don't have to be victims to that anymore. And as we appreciate and understand this, our faith will grow. If you turn in the book of Romans, chapter 4, I believe this is why Paul's bringing up the example here again of Abraham. Abraham's this great example, not just of faith, but of promises. And I think this passage shows us the idea of how God's promises spark and infuse our faith to trust him because of how he promises and what he promises and why he makes those promises. In Romans 4, beginning in verse 13, it reads this way, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it, had been, for if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but, there is no law, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith, and he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. This is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone. But for ours also, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up from our, for our trespasses and raised for our justification. I love the way that Paul here in Romans describes the promises of God and the fact that it sparks and ignites faith if we're going to lean into those promises. Abraham here being the great example the phrase that I just love and always catches my heart when I read it is in verse 18. In hope, he believed against hope. What does that mean? It means you can put your hope in a lot of things, and this world offers lots of avenues and outlets for you to put your hope in. But as far as having a child, Abraham's worldly hopes offer no hope at all. He's a hundred. Sarah's barren. What are the chances? Worldly standards? Zero. God's standards, he said it, and it came to pass. In the hope of God, he believed against the hope found in the world, and he found a God that does not break his promises. This is what it means for us to flee to God for refuge. That he is unwavering and fully convinced means that you and I can be unwavering and fully convinced in our faith. And so I tell you this morning, if you desire to grow in your faith, you need to take some time to understand the nature of God making promises to us. To know what those promises are, who they apply to certainly is part of that. And how we live in light of those promises, just as Abraham did. The next part of Hebrews 6.18 says that we might take strong encouragement from this, that we can live lives standing on his promises because they don't fail. I love when we take the time to think about these, that God makes promises, again, not for his benefit, but for our benefit. His promises strengthen us, carry us through each day, and cultivate in us the kind of spirit we're meant to have as we grow through this life. That's what the promises of God 
do. Back in 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4, those verses we read earlier, how does Peter describe these promises? Precious and very great. Joshua 21 described them as all the good promises. They're for our benefit. And so we can be encouraged. We can stand up a little straighter. We can hold our head high because God makes promises to us. And while I'm not going to go through all 7,000, I do want to share a few specifics because I think it helps. And I hope it whets your appetite to get into your Bible and read the promises God makes to us. Listen to some of these precious and very great promises. Do you know these and do you abide in them day by day? Hebrews chapter 13, if you turn there with me, says that we are promised God's care and providence, that he's going to take care of us when we put our trust in him. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6, Keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You see, he's promised us that he's with us, that he cares for us, that we can be content because we know that God watches over us and our needs. We have the promise that God listens to us and answers us. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. This is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. That is awesome. Do you have a guarantee that any time you pick up the phone and call somebody that they're going to answer you? I, it doesn't matter if they know you, they don't recognize your number, so they screen your call. Whether they recognize your number and screen your call is another aspect that might happen. Whether it's genuinely they didn't have the time to pick up the phone. Again, humans. And that's just circumstantial. That's just part of life. You never have to worry about that with God. He always hears. He always, to use that metaphor, picks up the phone. He doesn't even give it a chance to ring once. Picks it up right away. He wants to hear from us. We have the awesome promise that he hears us, and when we pray to him according to his will, when we're truly trusting in him, that he answers us. What an awesome thing to consider when we take each other's name before the throne. In these trying times, in each of our individual lives, that when a brother or sister prays for us, that this is the promise for them and for us, knowing that God hears. So let's do it more. We have the promise that we face temptations, we can find escape from those temptations. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is conditional, Right? But God's promise is every time you face a temptation, a choice where you could turn your back on God and pursue worldly desires, he says there is a way of escape, and yes, you can choose to take it. He's not going to take away your free will and kick you out the door of that temptation. You need to make a choice. The promise is that door will always be open if you're looking for it. And if we do falter, if we fail to seek that door, for the Christian, we have the promise of repentance and forgiveness. Again in 1 John, this time in chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I know plenty of Christians, myself included, that need to think about this verse as a promise. That God promises that when we turn to him, that when we give our hearts back to him, when we truly express godly grief over the mistakes we make, that he is faithful and just to make us white as snow again, just as when we were baptized. It's a beautiful promise, and I'm worried we just overlook it so easily. But it's there for us to stand on and to take comfort in and assurance in. Now, as I said, there's 
uh, whatever 7,000 minus 4 is, there's lots more <laughs> to go through here. Here's what I want you to understand, again, that this is just kind of getting your interest and awareness of all the promises on every page of your Bibles. Every single one of these promises is made possible in Jesus. So if you read through your Bible and say, these promises, these promises are so great, God's making all these promises, they don't just fall into your lap. They don't just happen because. The scriptures say, and we'll turn to 2 Corinthians 1 where it expressly says this, that the promises of God are fulfilled in Jesus. So do you want the promises of God? Follow Jesus. Get into Christ. Be a part of his body and put your trust and your life in his hands. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 22. Paul, writing to the Cor uh, Corinthian church here, says, As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. You see, Paul can't help but bring up this idea of Jesus being the yes of these promises without bringing up some more promises to realize. He's put a seal on us and given us the spirit as a guarantee of this hope of heaven. What's that all mean? It's in Jesus that all these promises are realized and fulfilled. So much so that he says, this is why in Jesus' name, by Jesus' authority, we utter our amen to God. What does amen mean? It's not hanging up the phone. Amen literally means it shall be so. I am so fully convinced that God has heard my prayer and that he answers those who plead to him according to his will. I can say, yes, God has heard me. He's aware. He cares. He's doing something about it. That's the trust. That's the faith that comes from realizing every promise of God finds its yes in Jesus. So are you following Jesus? Do you take the strong encouragement of all these promises realized in the one who came to take your place, to suffer and die for your sin and your rebellion against the great God of the universe? That's where we take strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us, as Hebrews 6.18 concludes. Ultimately, all these promises are guiding us to what I would call the promise of God. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 25, this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6 describes that the Gentiles in particular, but now everyone can become partakers of the promise in Jesus Christ through the gospel. This promise is that God wants us to be in his family, that he's made a way for it to be possible, and that because Jesus died for you, you can now be right with God. And when you stand on that promise, when you live your life realizing the truth of that promise, you can hold fast to the hope that this life is not all that there is. And that when we put our trust in God through every up and down in this life, that there is a rest and a reward waiting for us at the end. It is awesome to think about God making these promises. Most of the time, in a lot of ways, God will make promises through what the scriptures will call and what we'll call today covenants. It's this agreement process between two different parties, which involves mutual participation. As we've already said, we don't have to worry about God faltering or falling through on his end of the covenant. The question is, am I putting my trust in him? Am I living in faith of that covenant? Under the old covenant, we can see how people could succeed or fail in that. But as Gary read for us from the table this morning, the new covenant that you and I are under is established through the blood of Christ. So are we living like we've been washed by that blood? Do we take verses like 2 Corinthians 6, 16 into chapter 7 and verse 1 
to be what they say and to let God transform our lives. If you're still in 2 Corinthians 1, turn a few pages over to chapter 6. This is one of those places where I just think it's unfortunate that there are chapter breaks because verse 1 just, it, it, it pulls together the things that are said at the end of chapter 6 so well. Here's what we see beginning in verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 6. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, notice the promise language here, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, covenant language. God's promise, I'm going to walk among you, I'm, I'm going to be your God, you're going to be my people. Therefore, here's what you need to do to take a hold of this promise. Go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. When we take the time to consider the great nature of God's promises, the immense opportunity and the infinite blessings that come with God's promises, there's a therefore. You've got to be separate from this world. You've got to put the hope in this world aside. You've got to let go. Be separate from this world. Touch no unclean thing. And yeah, that can feel difficult. That might even be painful depending on what you have to leave behind. But the promise is, I will welcome you. I will be a father to you. And you're my son and my daughter. That makes any sacrifice we make to hold fast to this hope worth it. And I can say that and God can say that. The question is, do you believe that? We are encouraged to flee to God for refuge, to receive strong encouragement, and to hold fast to the hope, all because God is a God who makes promises. We see that the gospel itself is an invitation to embrace and live by the promise of God found in the salvation through Jesus Christ. Let's read Acts chapter 2 together for a moment as we close. Verses 38 and 39. Je or Peter here is preaching Jesus to this crowd on the day of Pe Pentecost. First gospel sermon as we have it recorded. And he comes to his conclusion. His audience is, is cut to the heart and they ask Peter and the apostles, what are we supposed to do? We realize we're guilty of sin. We've crucified the Son of God. It's my sin that put him there, which you and I can say as well. What are we supposed to do? Peter responds in verse 38, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Do you feel far off from God this morning? And you feel like, He couldn't be making these promises to me. Read verse 39 again. It's for everyone. It is for those who have left. You and your children, those who have crucified Jesus, and for all who are far off, because God is calling you to come home. He went through every length besides taking your freedom of choice to actually choose him away. Have you obeyed this gospel? Have you laid hold of this promise? That when you repent and are baptized into Jesus Christ, you are washed clean and you are added to the family of God. That's what 3,000 souls did on the day of Pentecost. That's what you have the opportunity to do now if you have not yet. This is about whether you take God at his word and trust his promises. Because just as he promises eternal life for us who obey the gospel, he promises that if we reject this invitation, that if we put it on hold, that if we ignore it and wait for another day, that might never come to obey it. But there's consequences to that. Eternal separation from him rather than eternal bliss with him. And so this morning, I beg and plead with those who have not obeyed. Ask your questions. 
bring them up to me, to Scott, to the elders, to anyone here. We would love to help you understand that God is a God who makes promises and they do not fail. And when you put your trust in him, you will never be disappointed. You need to obey the gospel this morning. You need to ask prayers for your brother.